Welcome to the first issue of Angles. My name is Jan Berlowski, and I'm this issue's guest editor. The editorial committee thought it would be a good idea to have a video introduction rather than the usual written piece, and so this is it. The choice of form is also one of substance. Angles wants to be a journal that studies the Anglophone world using different methodologies, different perspectives, taking risks, experimenting, maybe even having fun. <laughs> you might discover a surprise or two as you browse through this issue. This issue's topic is inspired by the famous adage, brevity is the soul of wit. To expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night night, and time is time. <clears throat> uh, we're nothing but to waste night, day, and time. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit. <laughs> Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit. I hope that this section won't prove as dreary and repetitive as Ophelia's father. Nobody wants to be found dead, stabbed, hiding in the Queen's bedchamber. <gasps> Wretched, rash, intruding fool. The adage, brevity is the soul of wit, is often used to describe humor or sarcasm. It suggests that true wit exists only in shortened form, as if depth of meaning, soul, required brevity of form. And it also hints that humor loses its essence when explicated. We start with two studies on 20th century avant-garde poetry, poetry which aimed at trying to find the essence of language. The first contribution by Jasna Boskova focuses on Mina Loy and locates her work in the utopian movements of the early 20th century. This paper allows the reader to travel in time, revisiting the poetic luminaries and revolutionaries of that period. Axel Nem chose a different approach to study a different poet, Laureen Niedeker. He started with Freud's dictum that wit works through condensation and displacement, something which Niedeker defined as condensory. Nem's paper, which gives us a glimpse of the complexity of Niedeker's puns, also recalls the post-war context in which she wrote, one in which people feared the bomb. <laughs> the Cold War required humor. <laughs> contribution by Raphael Ricot studies one example of humor used as stress relief, that of John Lackey Brown, a professional U.S. diplomat. In this first stab at analyzing Brown's correspondence, Ricot introduces the reader to the cultural Cold War and how diplomats could use wit to advance political causes. After a graphic intermission, this issue offers papers which study brevity and wit to reveal something about language itself. In a very playful contribution, Jean-Jacques Le Cercle takes an excerpt from Sam Selvin's The Lonely Londoners, and through a series of axioms and propositions, Le Cercle not only gives us a primer on the wealth and wit afforded by New Englishes, he also makes serious points about the way language, through brevity and wit, questions us all, interpolates us. Shannon Wells Lassine also makes serious points when studying American sitcoms. From the early Dick Van Dyke to the Big Bang Theory, sitcoms can be funny, but they also try to squeeze serial moral lessons between a couple of jokes. In some cases, the point of comedy is to prove that there is no point in making a point. And this is what Thomas Britt suggests in his paper on the best show on WFMU, a radio show in New Jersey. 
Frit analyzes a famous sketch entitled Rock, Rot, and Rule. The sketch shows how the search for critical brevity can lead to chaos. A funny chaos at that, as an imaginary author tries to settle disputes between musical experts by devising a foolproof method that is just that. Foolish. You can listen to the audio clips with the infuriated reactions of the listeners. If you've ever watched Fox News, you'll recognize some of the most obvious rhetorical fallacies. The last piece, On Brevity and Wit, offers a sort of typology of one-liners using linguistics. But hold on, this is linguistics made fun. In her paper, Catherine Chauvin takes different types of one-liners, ones based on puns, on ambiguous syntax, and so on, to show how central these examples are to key questions in linguistics, such as default meaning, the role of context, and so on. You'll want to try a few examples on students and friends, for documentary purposes, of course. In this issue's Varia section, we have three very different and really exciting contributions. The first paper is an analysis of a parodic zombie movie, Shaun of the Dead, but the analysis is in comic book form. That's right, a serious comic book analyzing a parodic zombie movie. In this original contribution, Nicolas Labarre and Jean-François Bayon study the interplay between the romantic comedy and the zombie film genres. You might also want to read Nicolas Labar's reflections on the making of, not of the movie, but of the comic book analysis. In his blog, he provides the necessary background to understand why this contribution works better in this form than in any other. The second contribution is a video documentary in which Mathilde Bertrand interviewed photographer Nigel Dickinson. Dickinson talks about his work covering a miner strike at Lee Hall in the mid-1980s. The photographer recalls the context of the strike and how a mining community in Staffordshire used his photographs to tell their story their way. This was a welcome change to the way in which the media told the story for them. The last contribution in this section is a study of the Emperor Jones by the Wooster Group. In this paper, Emeline Jouve uses Judith Butler's theories on performativity to see how the Wooster group troubles the notions of genre and race by having Emperor Jones, a black man, played by a white woman in blackface. Jouve's study shows how theater can effectively question the world and perhaps bring about change. I believe that these three contributions in the various section paved the way for original research on pressing issues, but research which can use new forms which make full use of the online format of this journal. Other issues of Angles are already in the works, I'm happy to say, and you can find more information on the journal's website. I hope you enjoy this issue.